Book 13. When Zeus had driven against his ships, the Trojans and Hector, he left them beside these to endure the hard work and sorrow of fighting without respite, and himself turned his eyes shining far away, looking out over the land of the Thracian riders and the Mysians who fight at close quarters, and the proud Hippomologi, drinkers of milk, and the Abiyo, moist righteous of all men. He did not at all now turn his shining eyes upon Troy land, for he had no idea in mind that any one of the immortals would come down to stand by either Danans or Trojans. Neither did the powerful shaker of the earth keep blind watch, for he sat and admired the fighting and on the run of the battle, aloft on top of the highest summit of the timbered Samos, the Thracian place. And from there all Ida appeared before him, and the city of Priam was plain to see, and the ships of the Achaeans, there he came up out of the water and sat and pitied the Achaeans, who were beaten by the Trojans, and blamed Zeus for it in bitterness. So presently he came down from the craggy mountain, striding on rapid feet, and the tall mountains trembled in the timber under the immortal feet of Poseidon's progress. He took three long strides forward, and in the fourth came to his goal, Aige, where his glorious house was built in the water's depth, glittering with gold and perishable forever. And going there, he harnessed under his chariot his bronze-shod horses, flying-footed, with long mane streaming with gold, and he put on clothing of gold about his own body, and took up the golden lash carefully, compacted, and climbed up into his chariot, and drove it across the waves. And about him the sea beasts came up from their deep places, and played in his path, and acknowledged their master, and the sea stood apart before him rejoicing. The horses winged on delicately, and the bronze axle beneath was not wetted. The fast-running horses carried him to the ships of the Keans. There is a cave, broad and deep down in the gloom of the water, lying beneath, midway between Tenedos and Imbros of the high cliffs. There Poseidon, the shaker of the earth, reined in his horses and slipped them from the yoke, and threw fodder immortal before them so they could eat, and threw around their feet golden hobbles not to be broken or slipped from, so they would wait there steadfast for their lord gone. And Poseidon went to the ships of the Keans. But the Trojans, gathered into a pack, like flame, like a storm cloud, came on after Hector the son of Priam, raging and relentless, roaring and crying as one. And their hopes ran high of capturing the ships of the Keans and killing the best men beside them, all of them. But Poseidon, who circles the earth and shakes it, rose up out of the deep water to stir on the Argives, likening himself in form and weariless voice to Calacus. First, he spoke to Aeantes, who were burning, the, burning for battle already. Aeantes, you too, remembering the spirit of warcraft, and not that of shivering panic, must save the Achaean people. Elsewhere in truth I do not fear the Trojans' invincible hands, though in full force they have swarmed over our great wall, since the strong grieved Achaeans will be able to hold out the rest of them. But I fear most terribly the disaster to us in the one place where that berserk flame-like leads them against us, Hector, who claims he must be son of Zeus of the high strength. May this be the message some of one of the gods gives your minds to carry, that you stand fast strongly yourselves, urge the rest to stand also. Thus hard through he sweeps on, you might stay him beside the fast-running ships, even though the very Olympian wakes him to battle. Poseidon, who circles the earth and shakes it, spoke, and striking both of them with his staff, filled them with powerful valor. And he made their limbs light and their feet and their hands above them, and burst into winged flight himself like a hawk with quick wings, who from the huge height of an impassable rock lifting leans to flight to pursue some other bird over the wide land. So Poseidon, shaker of the earth, broke away from the, from the Aintes, and the too swift Aias son of Oleus was first to know him, and spoke therewith to Aias the son of Telamon. Aias... Son, since some of, I ask, since some one of the gods whose hell, hold is Olympus has likened himself to Seer and told us to fight by our vessels, this is not Calchas, the bird interpreter of the gods, for I knew easily as he went away from the form of his feet, the legs form from behind him. Gods, though gods, are conspicuous. Therefore, as for me, the spirit inside my inward breast drives me all the harder to carry on the war and the fighting, and my feet underneath me are eager and my hands above them. Ias, the son of Telamon, spoke to him in answer. So for me also now the invincible hands on my spear shaft are furious. My strength is rising, and both feet beneath me are sweeping me onward, so that I long even for single combat with Hector, Priam's son, the forever avid of battle. Now as these two were saying such things to each other, joyful in the delight of battle, the god had put into their spirits. Meanwhile the earth and circular stirred up the Achaeans behind them, who were cooling the heat of the inward heart back beside their vessels, for their very limbs were broken with weariness of hard work, and also discouragement of the heart came over them, as they watched the Trojans, and how in a mass they had oversworn the great wall, 
As they saw them, the tears dripped from their eyes. They did not think they could win clear of the evil, but the earth shaker, lightly turning their battalions to strength, drove them onward. He came first to, in encouragement to Teucros and Litos, with the fighting Penelaos and Dipiros and Thoas, and Meriones and Antilochus, both urgent for battle. Calling out to these in winged words, he rallied them onward. Shame, you Argives, young fighting men, since I, for my part, have confidence that by fighting you can save our ships from destruction. But if you yourselves are, are to go slack from the sorrowful fighting, now is seen your day to be beaten down by the Trojans. Oh, for shame, here is a great strange thing I see with my own eyes. A terrible thing, and one that I thought never could happen. That the Trojans could come against our ships, they who in time past were like fugitive deer before us, who in the forest are spoiled for scavengers and wolves and leopards who scattered an absolute cowardice. There is no war spirit within them. So before now the Trojans were unwilling to stand up against the strength and hands of the Chians, even for a little. But now, far from their city, they fight by the hollow vessels through the weakness of our leader and the hanging back of our people who have made their quarrel with him and will not stand in defense of the fast-running ships. Instead of this, they are killed against him. Yet even though it be utterly true that the sons of Atreus, the hero of wide powerful Agamemnon is guilty because he did dishonor to Peleus' son, the swift-footed. Still, there is no way for us now to hang back from the fighting. No sooner let us heal it, for the hearts of great men can be healed. But you can no longer in honor give way from the fighting valor, being all the best men along the host. Even I, for my part, would not quarrel with any man who hung back from the fighting because he was a weak thing. But with you, my heart must be angry. O oh, friends, soon you will bring to pass some still greater evil with this hanging back. Let every one of you plant in his heart's depth dis discipline and shamefastness. A big battle rises against you, for Hector of the great war cry is fighting beside our vessels in his power and has broken our gates and the long door bar. So urging them on, the earth encircler stirred up the Achaeans and their battalions formed in strength about the two Aintes. Battalions the war god could not find fault with, coming among them, nor Athene, lady of storming armies, since there the bravest formed apart and stood against the Trojan and brilliant Hector, locking spear by spear, shield against shield at the base. So buckler leaned on buckler, helmet on helmet, man against man, and the horsehair crest along the horns of the shining helmets touched as they bent their heads. So dense were they formed on each other, and their spears shaken from their daring hands made a jagged battle line. Their thoughts were driving straight ahead in the fury of fighting. The Trojans came down on them in a pack, and Hector led them straging straight forward, like a great rolling stone from a rock face that a river swollen with winter rain has wrenched from its socket, and with immense washing broken the hold of the unwilling rock face, the springing boulder flies on, and the forest thunders beneath it. And the stone runs unwavering on a strong course till it reaches the flat land, then rolls no longer for all its onrush. So Hector, for a while, threatened lightly to break through the shelters and ships of the Achaeans, and reach the water cutting his way. But when he collided with the dense battalions, he was stopped hard, beaten in on himself. The sons of the Achaeans against him, stabbing at him with swords and leaf-headed spears, thrust him away from them so that he gave ground backward, staggering. He lifted his voice and called on a piercing cry to the Trojans. Trojans, Lycians, Dardanians who fight at close quarters, stand with me. The Achaeans will not hold me back for a long time, for they are all building themselves into a bastion against, bastion against me. No, I think they will give back under my spear if truly I am driven by the greatest of gods, the thunderous Lord of Hera. So he spoke, and stirred the spirit and strength in each man. Among them, Diophobos, in high purpose, had come striding, Priam's son, who held the perfect circle of his shield before him, moving lightly on his feet as he walked in the shield's protection. Meriones aimed at him with a shining spear and threw it, nor missed his mark, but struck the shield on his perfect circle of a bull's hide. But the spear did not go through, but sooner the long shaft was broken behind the head. Diophobos held the bull's hide shield away from him, his heart frightened by the spear of his wise Meriones. But that hero drew back into the host of his wide companions, deeply angered for two things, the broken spear and the loss of his battle and went away back to the shelters and ships of the Achaeans to bring back a long spear that was left behind in his shelter. But the rest fought on with clamor incessant rising about them. Teucros, son of Telamon, was the first to kill his man. Imbrios, the spear fighter, son of Mentor of the many horses, one who before the coming of the sons of the Achaeans lived in Pideos and had married the bastard daughter of Priam, Medicasti. But when the overswept oars of the Danans came, he went back to Ilion and was a great man among the Trojans and lived at Priam's side, who honored him as he did his own children. 
Now the son of Telamon with a long spear stabbed him under the ear and wrenched the spear out again, and he dropped like an ash tree, which, on the crest of a mountain glittering far about, cut down with a bronze axe, scatters on the ground as delicate leafage. So he dropped, and the armor elaborate with bronze clashed about him, and Teucros ran up, eager to strip the armor. As he came on, Hector threw at him with a shining javelin, but Teucros, with his eyes straight on him, avoided this bronze spear by a little, and Hector struck Anthemachos, son of Actorian, Cateos, with a spear in his chest as he swept into battle. He fell thunderously, and his armor clattered upon him. Then Hector charged in to tear the helm of the great-hearted Anthemachos from his head where it fitted close on the brows. But Aias thrust the shining spear at Hector as he came onward. He could not manage to reach the skin, since this was all shrouded in the ghastly bronze, but drove with the shield's mass in the middle and beat him back in great strength so that Hector gave ground backward from both corpses. These the Achaeans dragged out of the fighting. Then Stachios and brilliant Menestheus, lords of the Athenians, carried Amphimachus back from among the Achaean people. But the two Aintes, in the fury of their fierce war strength, as two lions catch up a goat from the guard of a rip-fanged hounds, and carry it into the destiny of the underbrush, holding it high from the ground in the crook of their jaws, so the lordly two Aintes lifted Ambrios high and stripped him of his armor, and the son of Oleos in anger from Amph. Amphimachos hewed away his head from the soft neck and threw it spinning like a ball through the throng of fighters until it came to rest in the dust at the feet of Hector. Then Poseidon was angered about the heart at his grandson slaying in the bitter hostility. So the god went forth on his way among the shelters and ships of the Achaeans and stirred the Danans and worked disaster against the Trojans. Idomeneus, the spear famed, encountered him on his way from a companion who had just come, just before come back from the fighting, wounded in the hollow behind the knee by the sharp bronze. This man his companions carried away. Idomeneus had given the healers instructions and gone on to his shelter, still burning to face the battle. And now the strong earth shaker spoke to him. Poseidon likened his voice to Thoas, son of Adramon, lord of the Aetolians, over all Pleuron, and headlong Calydon, who was honored in his countryside as a god is. Idomeneus, lord of the Cretans' councils, where are these threats you gave now that the sons of the Achaeans uttered against the Trojans? Then Idomeneus, lord of the Cretans, answered him in turn, Thoas, no man is responsible for this. So far as my thought goes, since all of us understand how to wage war, it is not that heartless fear holds anyone, that a man yielding to dread emerges out of the evil fighting, but rather this way must be pleasurable to Cronus' son and his great strength, that the Achaeans must die here forgotten and far from Argos. Since you, Thoas, have been before this man, this a man stubborn in battle and stirred up another whenever you saw one hang back, so now also do not give up and urge on each man as you find him. Then in answer spoke the shaker of the earth Poseidon, Idomeneus, may that man who this day willfully hangs back from the fighting never win home again out of Troyland, but stay here and be made dogs delight for their feasting. Come then, take up your armor and go with me. We must speed this action together since we, being two, might bring some advantage. The warcraft even of sad fighters combined turns courage, and you and I would have skill to fight even against good men. So he spoke and strode on, a god through the mortal struggle. Idomeneus, when he came back to a strong-built shelter, drew his splendid armor over his body and caught up two spears and went on his way. As a thunderbolt, which the son of Cronos, catching up in his hand, shakes from the shining edge of Olympus, flashes a portent to men, and the bright glints shine from it. Such was the glitter of bronze that girt his chest and his running. Close to his shelter there encountered him his strong henchman, Meriones, who was on his way to pick up a bronze spear and bring it back. Adomenius, in his strength, spoke to him. Meriones, son of Molo, swift-footed, dearest beloved companion, why have you come back and left the battle and fighting? Have you been hit somewhere? Does pain of a spear's head afflict you? Have you come back with someone's message for me? For my part, my desire is to fight, not sit away in the shelters. Meriones, a thoughtful man, spoke to him in answer. Idomeneus, lord of the councils of the bronze armor of Cretans, I am on my way to bring back a spear, if you have any left in your shelter. I broke just now the one I was carrying with a throw made against his shield of haughty Diphobos. Then Idomeneus, lord of the Cretans, answered him in turn, You will find one spear and twenty spears, if you want them, standing against a shining inward wall in my shelter. Trojan spears I win from men that I kill, for my way is not to fight my battle standing far away from my enemies. Thereby I have spears there, the sh and shields massive in the middle, and helms and corsets are there, and all the pride of their shining. Miriones, a thoughtful man, spoke to him in answer. 
For me also, beside my shelter and beside my black ship, there are many spoils of the Trojans, but not near for me to get them. For I tell you, neither am I one who has forgotten his war strength, but among the foremost, among the fighting where men win glory, I take my stand whenever the quarrel of battle arises. Let my fighting be forgotten by some other bronze armor to king in. You are the very one I think must know of it. Then Idomeneus, lord of the Cretans, answered him in turn, I know your valor and what you are. Why, you need, why need you speak of it? If now beside the ships all the best of us were to assemble for a hidden position, and there man's courage is best decided, where the man who is a coward and the brave man show themselves clearly, the skin of the coward changes color one way and another. And the heart inside him has no control to make him steady, but he shifts his weight from one foot to another, then settles firmly on both feet. And the heart inside his chest pounds violent as he thinks of the death spirits and his teeth chatter together. But the brave man's skin will not change color, nor is he too much frightened once he has taken his place in the hidden position. But his prayer is too close as soon is too close as soon as may be in bitter division, and there no man could make light of your battle strength of your hand's work. Even were you to be wounded in your work with spear cast or spear stroke, the weapon would not strike behind your neck nor on your back, but would be driven straight, straight, straight against the chest or the belly as you made your way onward through the meeting of champions. But come, let us no longer stand here talking of these things like children, for fear some man may arrogantly scold us. Go to my shelter and choose for yourself a heavy spear. So he spoke, and Meriones, a match for the rapid war god, went into the shelter rapidly and took up a bronze spear. And with his mind deeply set on battle, followed Idomeneus. As man slaughtering Ares is when he strides into battle, and terror goes on beside him, his beloved son, the powerful and dauntless, who frightens him, even the patient-hearted warrior. These two came out of Thrace to encounter in arms the Ephriel, or the great-hearted Phalyges. But the two will not listen to prayers from both sides, but give the glory to one side or the other. Such were Meriones and Idomeneus, leaders of armies, as they went on into, on into the fighting, helmed in the bright bronze. First the two, Meriones, spoke his word to Idomeneus. Ducalides, where are you minded into the battle? Would it be on the right of the whole array, or in the center, or to the left, since I think that nowhere else in the fighting are the flowing here to Keans overmatched so badly? Idomeneus, lord of the Cretans, answered him in turn. There were others beside us to defend the ships in the center, the two Antes and Teucros, best of all the Achaeans in archery, and a good man in the close of standing combat. They can give Hector, Priam's son, enough hard hitting, even though he is very strong and sweeps hard into battle. Furious though he is for fighting, it will be very steep work for him to win through their irresistible hands and their war strength and fire the ships, unless the son of Cronos in person should hurl the blazing firebrand into our fast-running vessels. Nor would huge Telamonian Ias give way to any man, one who was mortal and ate bread, the yield of Demeter, one who could be broken by the bronze and great stones flung at him. He would not make way for Achilles, who breaks men in battle in close combat. For speed of feet, none can strive with Achilles. Hold, as you say, for the left of the army, and thus soonest shall we see whether we win glory or give it to others. He spoke, and Meriones, a match for the running war god, led the way till they came to the place in the army he spoke for. These, as they saw Idomeneus, like a flame in his valor himself, and his henchmen with him in their elaborate war gear. They called out across the battle and gathered about him, and an indiscriminate fight rose up by the sterns of the vessels, as when under the screaming winds the whirlstorms bluster. On that day when the dust lies deepest along the pathways, and the winds and the confusion of dust uplift a great cloud, such was their indiscriminate battle, and their hearts were furious to slaughter each other with a sharp bronze through the press of the fighting. The battle where men perish shudders, now with the long man-tearing spears they held in their hands. Their eyes were blinded in the dows of the bronze light from the glittering helmets, from the burnished corselets and the shining shields as men came on in confusion. That man would have to be very bold-hearted, who could be cheerful and not stricken, looking on that struggle. Two powerful sons of Kronos, hearts divided against each other, were wreaking bitter agonies on the fighting warriors, since Zeus willed the victory for the Trojans and Hector, glorifying swift-footed Achilles, Yet not utterly did he wish the Achaean people to be destroyed before Ilion, but only was giving glory to Thetis and her strong-spirited son, while Poseidon, emerging unseen from the gray salt water, went among the Argives and stirred them, since he was angered that they, had been, they were beaten by the Trojans and blamed Zeus for it bitterly. Indeed, the two were of one generation and a single father, but Zeus was the elder born and knew more. Therefore Poseidon shrank from openly defending them, but secretly in a man's likeness was forever stirring them up to the army. 
So these two had looped over both sides, a crossing cable, a strong discord, and the closing of battle, not to be slipped, not to be broken, which unstrung the knees of many. There, Idomeneus, graying though he was, called on the Danans and charged in upon the Trojans and drove panic among them, for he killed Othryones, a man who had lived in Cabezos, who was newly come in the wake of the rumor of war, and had asked Priam for the hand of the loveliest of his daughters, Cassandra, without bride price, but had promised a great work for her, to drive back the unwilling sons of the Achaeans from Troyland. And aged Priam had bent his head in assent and promised to give her so. So Orthrionus fought in the faith of his promises. Odomaeus aimed at him with a shining spear and threw it, and hit him as he came on over the high stride, and the corslet of bronze he wore could not hold, and the spear fixed in the middle belly. He fell thunderously, and Idomeneus, vaunting, cried out, Othryonus, I congratulate you beyond all others, if it is here that you will bring to pass what you promise, to Dardanian Priam, who in turn promised you his daughter. See now, we also would make you a promise, and we would fulfill it. We would give you the loveliest of Atreid's daughter, and bring her here from Argos to be your wife, if you joined us and helped us storm the strong founded city of Ilion. Come then with me, so we can meet by our seafaring vessels about a marriage. We here are not bad matchmakers for you. The hero Idomeneus spoke and dragged him through the strong encounter, caught by the foot. But now Asaios came to stand by him, dismounted ahead of his horses, whom his henchmen held ever behind him. So they breathed on his shoulders. He was striving in all his fury to strike Idomeneus, but he, too quick with a spear cast, struck him in the gorge underneath his chin and drove the bronze clean through. He fell as when an oak goes down on, or a white poplar, or like a towering pine tree, which in the mountains the carpenters have hewn down with their wetted axes to make a ship timber. So he lay there, felled in front of his horses and chariots, roaring and clawed with his hands at the bloody dust. Meanwhile, the charioteer who was close beside him was stricken in the wits, and shrinking from the hands of the enemy did not have daring to turn the horses about. But Antilochus, stubborn in battle, pinned him through the middle with a spear stroke, and the course of the bronze he wore could not hold, and the spear fixed in the middle belly, so they tumbled, gasping at a strong rock chariot. But for the horses, Antilochus, son of the great-haired Nestor, drove them away from the Trojans among the strong, grieved Achaeans. Dephobos, in sorrow for Asios, now came close in on Idomeneus, with a bright spear made a cast at him. But Idomeneus, with his eyes straight on him, avoided the bronze spear, since also he was hidden beneath his shield's perfect circle. That shield he carried, hooped in circles of glaring bronze and the skins of oxen, fitted with double cross stays. He was all gathered together under this, and the brazen spear shot over him, and the shield gave out a hollow clash as the spear glanced from it. Yet Dephobos made no utterly vain cast from his strong hand, but struck Hyp. Hypsenor, son of Hippesos, shepherd of the people, in the liver under the midriff, and at once took the strength from his knees. And Diphobos vaunted terribly over him, calling in a great voice, Asaios lies now, not now all avenged, unavenged. I think rather as he goes down to Hades of the gates, the strong one, he'll be cheerful at heart, since I have sent him an escort. He spoke, and sorrow came over the Argives at his, at his vaunting, and beyond others stirred the spirit in wise Antilochus, Yet sorrowful though he was, he did not forget his companion, but running stood and bestrode him and covered him under the great shield. Thereon, Mechistius, son of Echios and brilliant Alastor, two staunch companions stooping beneath it, caught up Hypsenor and carried him, groaning heavily, to the hollow vessels. Idomeneus did not slacken his great fury, but always was straining to shroud some one of the Trojans in dark night, or go down crashing himself as he fought the bane from the Achaeans. There was a man loved by, loved son of illustrious Aietes, the hero Akathos, who was son-in-law of Anchis, and had married the eldest of his daughters, Hypodemea, dear to the hearts of her father and the lady of her mother in the great house, since she surpassed all the girls of her own age for beauty and accomplishment and wit. For such reason, the man married her who was the best in the wide Troed. But now Poseidon beat him down at the hands of Idomeneus, for he bewitched his shining eyes and made moveless his bright limbs, so that he could not run backward, neither evade him, but stood like a statue or a tree with leaves towering motionless, while fighting Idomeneus stabbed at the middle of his chest with a spear and broke the bronze armor about him, which in time before had guarded his body from destruction. He cried out then, a great cry, broken the spear in him, and fell thunderously, and the spear in his heart was stuck fast, but the heart was panting still and beating to shake the butt end of the spear. 
Then in there, Ares the Huge took his life away from him. Idomeneus vaunted terribly over him, calling in a great voice, Diphobos, are we then to call this a worthy bargain? Three men killed for one? It was you yourself were so boastful, strange man. Do you rather come yourself and stand up against me so you can see what I am like? Zeus's seed, come here to face you. Since Zeus first got by Crete and Manos, who cared for his people, and Aminos in turn was born a blameless son to Kilion, and to Kilion sired me to be lord over many people in wide Crete, and now my ships have brought me to this place to be an evil for you and your father and the rest of the Trojans. So he spoke, and the heart of Dephobos was divided, pondering whether to draw back and find some other high-hearted Trojan to be his companion, or whether to attempt him singly. And the division of his heart this way seemed best to him, to go for Aeneas. He found him at the uttermost edge of the battle, standing, since he was forever angry with brilliant Priam, because great as he was, he did him no honor among his people. Diphobos came and stood close to him and addressed him in winged words. Aeneas, lord of the Trojans' council, now there is need of you to stand by your brother-in-law if this bond of kinship touches you. Come then, stand by Akathos, who was your sister's husband, and in time past nursed you in his house when you were still little. But now Idomeneus the spear-famed has killed him in battle. So he spoke and stirred the anger in the breast of Aeneas. He went against Idomeneus, strongly eager for battle. Yet no fear gripped Idomeneus as if he were a stripling. But he stood his ground like a mountain wild boar, who in the confidence of his strength stands up to a great rabble of men advancing upon him in some deserted place, and bristles his back up, and both his eyes were shining with fire. He grinds his teeth in his fury to fight off the dogs and the men. So spear-famed Idomeneus held his ground and would not give way to Anias coming against him. But bellowed to his companions, looking to Ascalaphos and Aphraeus and Dipros and Meriones and Antichilochus, both urgent for battle, and stirring all these forward, called out to them in winged words, This way, friend, stand by me. I am alone, and terribly I fear the attack of swift-footed Anias advancing upon me, powerful as he is for the slaying of men in battle. Likewise, the flower of youth is his, where men's strength is highest. Since were we two of the same age and in the same spirit, soon he would win me in a great battle, or I would win him. So he spoke, and all these, a single spirit within them, came and stood in their numbers, and sloped their shields over his shoulders, and Aeneas on the other side called to his own companions, looking to Diphobos and to Paris and brilliant Agenor, who were lords of the Trojans along with him, and the people after them, followed on, as when the sheep follow the lead ram, as they lead the pasture to drink, and make proud the heart of the shepherd. And thus also the heart of Aeneas was gladdened within him, as he saw the swarm of the host following his own leadership. These then drove on in close combat against Alcathus, with long spears and the bronze girding the chests of the fighters, clasped horribly the spears they threw in the press at each other. And two men, for warcraft preeminent beyond the others, Anias and Idomeneus, both men like the war god, were straining with the pitiless bronze to tear at each other. Anias was first with a spear cast at Idomeneus, but he, keeping his eyes straight on him, avoided the bronze spear, so that the vibrant shaft of Anias was driven groundward, since it had been thrown in a vain cast from his big hand. But Idomeneus hit Onomaios in the middle belly and broke the hollow of the corslet, so that the entrails spurted from the bronze, and he fell clawing the dust in his fingers. Idomeneus wrenched out his far-shadowing spear from his body, but had no power to strip the rest of his splendid armor away from his shoulders since he was beaten back by their missiles, and no longer in an outrush could his limbs stay steady beneath him, either to dash in after his spear or to get clear again. So in close standing fight he beat off the pitiless death day, as his feet no longer quick to run took him out of the fighting. As he backed slowly, Diphobos made a cast with his shining spear, since he held a fixed hatred forever against him, but missed him yet once again, and struck down the spear with the war god's son Ascalaphos, so that the powerful spear was driven through his shoulder, and he, dropping in the dust, clawed the ground in his fingers. But Ares, the huge, the bellowing, had yet heard nothing of how his son had fallen there in the strong encounter. But he, sheltered under the golden clouds on utmost Olympus, was sitting, held fast by command of Zeus, where the rest also, the immortal gods, were sitting still, in restraint from the battle. But the men drove on in close combat about Ascalaphos. Dephobos tore from Ascalaphos the shining helmet. <laughs> but now... <clears throat> Uh, Meriones, a match of the running war god, plunging upon him, stabbed his arm with a spear, and the hollow-eyed helmet dropped from his hand and fell to the ground, clashing. 
Mary owns and yet another swoop like a vulture, plucked out the heavy spear from the armor's base of the shoulder, then shrank into the host of his own companions. Pelides, Deiphobos' brother, caught him about by the waist with both arms and got him out of the sorrowful fighting and reached his fast-footed horses, where they stood at the rear of the fighting in the battle, holding the charioteer in the elaborate chariot. And these carried him, groaning heavily back to the city in pain, since the blood was running from his arm's fresh wound. But the rest fought on with clamor incessant, rising about them. There, Anias, lunging at Ephraim, the son of Kelator, struck him with a sharp spear in the throat, where it was turned outward him, turned toward him. He, his head bent over to one side, and his shield tumbled. And the, at, and the helm, the death breaking the spear, drifted about him. Antilochus, watching Thun as he turned about him, dashed in on him and slashed at him and shore away the entire vein which runs all the way up the back till it reaches the neck. This he shore away entire, so he sprawled on the dust backward, reaching out both hands to his beloved companions. Antilochus rushed on him, trying to strip the armor from his shoulders, but watchful as the Trojans gathered about him from all sides and beat at the shining broad shield, but could not get within it and tear at the pitiless bronze of Antilochus tender flesh for about him the earth shaker Poseidon guarded the son of Nestor even in the swarm of missiles since he was not making his way back clear of the enemy but would turn to face them nor held motionless in his spear always it was shaken or driven forward the desire in his heart forever to strike someone with a spear cast or drive at him in close combat Adamus Asaios' son was not blind to how he kept aiming with a spear in the battle and charging close stab with a sharp bronze at the shield's middle but Poseidon, with a dark-haired, made void his spear's stroke, nor would let him win the life of Antilochus. And half of the spear was struck fast like a stake fire-hardened in Antilochus' shield, and the other half lay on the ground. To avoid death, he shrank into the host of his own companions. But as he went back, Meriones, dog dogging him, threw with the spear and struck between the navel and genitals, where beyond all places death and battle comes painfully to pitiful mortals. There the spear struck fast, driven, and he, writhing about it, gasped as an ox does when among the mountains the herdsmen have driven, bound him strongly in twisted ropes, and dragged him unwilling. So he, stricken, gasped for a little while, but not long, until fighting Marion's came close and wrenched the spear out from his body, and a mist of darkness closed over both eyes. But Helenos, closing, struck Dipyros on the temple with a huge Thracian sword, sword, and broke the helmet to pieces so that it was knocked off and fell to the ground. And Achaeans picked it up where it rolled among the feet of the fighters, but the darkness of night misted over the eyes of Dipyros. Then Sorrow caught Atreus' son Menelaos of the great war cry, and he came on menacing and shaking his sharp spear at Helenos, the lord and fighter, who pulled against him the bow of the, at the hand grip, and both let fly at each other together, one with a sharp spear and a javelin cast, and one with an arrow from the bowstring. The son of Priam hit him then on the chest with an arrow in the hollow of the corslet, but the bitter arrow sprang far back. As along a great threshing floor from the broad blade of a shovel, the black skinned beans and the chickpeas bounce high. Under the whistling blast and the sweep of a winnowing fan, so back, back from the course of the glorious Menelaos, the bitter arrow rebounded far away, being driven hard back. But Atreus' son, Menelaos, the great war cry, struck him in the hand where he held the polished bow, and the bronze spear in the hand where he held the polished bow, and the bronze spear was driven clean on through the bow and the hand beyond it. To avoid death, he shrank into the host of his companions, dangling his wounded hand and dragging the ash spear with it. But great-hearted Agenor drew from his hand the spear and bound up his hand with a careful twist of wool fleece and a sling the henchman held for the shepherd of the people. Pisandros now came on straight against Menelaos, the glorious, but an evil destiny led him toward death's end, to be beaten down by you, Menelaos, in a stark encounter. Now when these in their advance were close to each other, the son of Atreus missed with his throw, and the spear was turned past him. But Pisandros stabbed with the spear and the shield of glorious Menelaos, but could not drive the bronze all the way through it, for the wide shield held against it, and the spear shaft was broken behind the head. Yet he was light-hearted and hopeful of victory, drawing his sword with the silver nails. The son of Atreus sprang at Pisandros, who underneath his shield's cover gripped his beautiful axe with strong bronze blade upon a long polished axe handle of olive wood. They made their strokes at the same time, and Pisandros chopped at the horn of the helmet crested with horsehair. At the very peak, Menela at the very peak, Menelao struck him as he came onward in the forehead with the, over the base of the nose and smashed the bones so that both eyes dropped bloodily and lay in the dust at his feet before him. He fell curling, and Menelaos, setting his heel on his chest, stripped off his armor and spoke exulting over him. 
So I think shall you lead the ships of the fast mountain Danans, you haughty Trojans, never to be glutted with the grim of war noises, nor go short of all that other shame and defilement, wherewith you defiled me, wretched dogs, and your hearts knew no fear at all of the hard anger of Zeus loud thundering, the guest god who some day will utterly sack your steep city. You who in vanity went away, taking with you my wedded wife and many possessions, when she had received you in kindness. And now once more you rage among our seafaring vessels to throw deadly fire on them and kill the fighting Achaeans. But you will be held somewhere, though you be headlong for bat so headlong for battle. Father Zeus, they say, your wisdom passes all others, of men and gods, and yet from you all this is accomplished, the way you give these outrageous people your grace, these Trojans whose fighting strength is a thing of blind fury. Nor can they ever be glutted full of the close encounters of deadly warfare, since there is safety in all these things, in sleep and lovemaking, in the loveliness of singing and the innocent dance. In all these things a man will strive sooner to win satisfaction than in war, but in this the Trojans cannot be glutted. So Menelaus the blameless spoke, and stripping the bloody armor away from his body, gave it to his companions, and turned back himself to merge in the ranks of champions. Now there sprang forth among against him the son of King Palamenius, Harpalion, who had followed his father into the fighting at Troy, and did not come home again to the land of his fathers. He from close up stabbed with his spear at the shield of Atreides in the middle, but could not drive the bronze all the way through it. To avoid death, he shrank into the host of his own companions, looking all about him for fear somebody might wound him with the bronze. But as he went back, Marion's let fly at him with a bronze shot arrow and hit him back beside the right buttock, so that the arrow was driven on through under the bone to fix in the bladder. And there, sitting among the arms of his beloved companions, he gasped out his life, then lay like a worm extended along the ground, and his dark blood drenched the ground in his running. And the great-hearted Phagogonians, busied about him, lifted him into a chariot and brought him to sacred Ilion. In sorrow, and his father, weeping tears, walked beside them, and no man price came his way for his son's slaying. But Paris was deeply angered at heart for this man's slaying, since he was his guest's friend among many Paphlagonians, and in anger for him he also let fly a bronze shot arrow. There was a man, Euchenor, son of the seer Polidus, a rich man and good who lived in his house of, at Corinth, who knew well that this was his death when he went on shipboard since many times the good old man of Politos had told him that he must die in his own house of a painful sickness, or go with the ships to the Achaeans and be killed by the Trojans. He therefore chose to avoid the troublesome price the Achaeans would ask, and the hateful sickness, so his heart might not be afflicted. Paris struck him by jaw and ear, and at once the life spirit fled from his limbs, and the hateful darkness closed in about him. So they fought on in the likeness of blazing fire, but meanwhile, Hector, beloved of Zeus, had not heard of this, and knew nothing of how to, how to the left of the ships his people were being slaughtered by the Argives, and glory for the Achaeans might even have been accomplished. Such was Poseidon who circles the earth and shakes it, as he stirred on the Argives and fought for them and his own strength. But Hector held where first he had broken away through the rampart and the gates and shattered the close ranks of the armored Danians, where, the lay, where lay the ships of the Is and the ships of uh, Protesalios, hauled up along the beach of the gray sea, and above these the wall they had built lay lowest, and there beyond all others dangerous was the onslaught of the Trojans and of their horses. There the Boetians and the Ionians with their trailing tunics, the Locrians and the Phythians with the shining Epeans, tried to hold him as he swept hard for the ships, but they could not avail to beat brilliant flame Hector back from them. There also were the chosen Athenian men, and among them Piteos' son, Menestheus, was lord, and there followed with him Phidias and Stychos and strong bias. But the Ephians were led by Megius, Phileus' son, and Amphion and Dracos, and before the Phythians were Medon and battle stubborn Podarchus. Now of these one, Medon was bastard son of Oleus, the godlike, and brother of Ias, Ias, yet he was living away from the land of his fathers in Phalaic, since he had killed a man, the brother of Eripios, his stepmother and wife of Olesios, but the other was son of Aphekios and the son of Phycolos. And these in arms, the forefront of the great-hearted Phythians, fought beside the Beotinians in defense of their vessels. But swift Ias, the son of Oleus, would not, would not at all now take his stand apart from Telamonian Ias, not even a little. But as two wine-colored oxen straining with even force dragged the compacted plow through the fallow land, and for both of them at the base of the horns the dense sweet gushes, only the width of the polished yoke keeps the space between them, 
as they toiled down the furrow till the share cuts the edge of the plowland. So these took their stand in battle close to each other. Now with the son of Telamon, many people and brave ones followed his companions and took over the great shield from him whenever the sweat and the weariness came over his body. But no Locrians went with his great-hearted son of Oleus. The heart was not in them to endure close-standing combat. For they did not have the brazen helmets crested with horsehair. They did not have the strong circled shields with the ash spears. But rather these had followed to Ilion with all their confidence in their bows and slings, strong twisted of wool. And with these they shot their close volleys and broke the Trojan battalions. So now these other fought in front in elaborate war gear against the Trojans and Hector the brazen helmed, and the Locrians unseen volley from behind them. So the Trojans remembered nothing of the joy of battle, since the shaft struck them to confusion. Now pitifully, the Trojans might have gone back from the shelters and the ships to windy Ilion, had not Polydamas come and stood beside bold Hector and spoken a word to him. Hector, you are too intractable to listen to reason. Because the God has granted you the actions of warfare, therefore you wish to counsel while also to be wise beyond others. But you cannot choose to have all gifts given to you together. To one man the God has granted the actions of warfare, to one to be a dancer, to another the lyre and the singing. And in the breast of another Zeus of the wide brow establishes wisdom, a lordly thing, and many take profit beside him, and he saves many, but the man's own thought surpasses all others. Now I'll tell you the way that it seems best to my mind. For you, everywhere the fighting burns in a circle around you. But of the great-hearted Trojans, since they cross over the rampart, some are standing back in their war gear. Others are fighting fewer men against many, being scattered among the vessels. Draw back now and call to this place all of our bravest, and then we might work out together our general council, whether we can fall upon their bent ships, if the god might be willing to give such power to us, or whether thereafter we can win away from the ships unhurt, since I fear the Achaeans might wreak on us requital for yesterday." since beside their ship lurks a man insatiate on fi fighting, and I think we can no longer utterly hold him from the fighting. So spoke Polydamas, and this counsel of safety pleased Hector, and at once in all of his armor he leapt to the ground from his chariot and spoke to him and dressed him in winged words. Polydamas, do you rather call back to their place all of our bravest? I am going over there to meet the attack, and afterward I will come back soon when I have properly given my orders. So he spoke and went on his way like a snowy mountain, calling aloud and swept through the Trojans and their companions. But the rest of them rallied quickly around the son of Panthos, courtly, Polydamas, each as they heard the command of Hector. But Hector ranged the ranks of the foremost fighters, searching for Dephobos and the strength of Helenos, the prince, and for Asios, son of Adamas, and Asios, Hyktarchos' son, if he might find them, but found them no longer utterly unwounded or living. But some were lying along the sterns of the keen vessels, they who had lost their lives at the hands of the Argives, and others were lying away inside the city with arrow or spear wounds. But he found one man away to the left of the sorrowful battle, brilliant Alexandros, the lord of lovely-haired Helen, encouraging his companions okay, and urging them on into battle. Debate, Hector came and stood, and in words of shame he rebuked him. So Evil Paris, beautiful woman crazy, cajoling, right where is Dephobos gone, and the strength of the prince of Helenos, Adam's Isos son, and Isos son of Hectorus, where is Erinotheus? Now all steep Ilion is lost, utterly, now your own headlong destruction is certain. Then in turn Alexandros the godlike answered him, Hector, since it, is your, since, since it is your pleasure to blame me when I am blameless, it be better some other time to withdraw from the fighting than now. My mother bore me not utterly lacking in warcraft, for since that time when my, by the ships you wakened the battle of our companions, we have stayed here and fought the Danans without end, and our companions are killed. For you killed are killed. You asked for only to Phobos and the strength of the prince Helenos have gone away, wounded each in the hand by strokes of the long spears. But the son of Cronus fended the death from them. Now lead on wherever your heart and spirit command you, and we shall follow you eagerly. I think that we shall not come short in warcraft, and so far as the strength stays with us. But beyond his strength, no man can fight, although he be eager. So the hero spoke and persuaded the heart of his brother. They went on to where the clamor and fighting were greatest. About Cabrions and Polydamas the blameless, about Falcus and Oretheus and godlike Polyphetes, Palamus and with Ascanios and Morius son of Hippotion, who had come over in their turn from fertile Ascania on the dawn before. And now Zeus turned them into the fighting. They went on as out of the racking winds the storm blast that underneath the thunderstroke of Zeus' father drives downward and with gigantic clamor hits the sea, and the numerous boiling waves along the length of the roaring water bend and whiten to foam in ranks, some lending 
leading and others. After them, after them in the glare of bronze armor followed their leaders, and Hector led them, Priam's son, a man like a murderous war god, and held the perfect circle of his shield before him, fenced deep in skins with a great fold of bronze beaten upon it, and about his temples was shaken as he went, with, went, as he went the glittering helmet. He would step forward to probe the Achaeans' battalions at all points, if they might give way they, where he stalked on under his shield's cover, but could not confuse the heart in the breasts of the Achaeans. Ias was first to take long strides forward and challenge him. Man, you are mad. Come closer. Why try this way to terrify the Argives? It is not that we are so unskilled in fighting, but by the wicked whiplash of Zeus we Achaeans are beaten. I suppose in your heart is hopeful utterly to break up our ships? We too have prompt hands among us that's to a strong to defend them. Rather, far before this, your own song found a citadel must go down under our hands, stormed and utterly taken. And for yourself, I say that the time is close, when in flight you will pray to Zeus' father and the other immortals, that your bright main horses might be swifter than hawks are, as they carry you through the stirred dust of the plain to your city. As he spoke so, an ominous bird winged by his right hand as towering eagle, and the host of the kings, made brave by the bird sign, shouted. But glorious Hector answered him, I ask you, you inarticulate ox, what is this you have spoken? If I could only be called son to Zeus of the Aegis all the days of my life, and the lady Hera of my mother, and I be honored as Apollo and Athena are honored, so surely as this is a day that brings evil to the Argives, all and you will be killed with the rest of them, if you have daring to stand up against my long spear, which will bite your delicate body. Yet then you will glut the dogs and birds of the Trojans with fat and flesh, struck down beside the ships of the Achaeans. So he spoke and led the way, and the rest of them followed him with unearthly clamor, and all the people shouted behind him. But the Argives on the other side cried out and would not forget their warcraft, but stood the attack of the bravest Trojans, and the clamor from both was driven high to Zeus's shining ether.